Perfect timing. All right. Well, but welcome, everybody, and thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Kaylee. I am the Director of Advancement and Operations at Stable. We are a new nonprofit organization in DC, and it was we were founded by artists to support artists. We do that through uh, below market studio space and really cool programming like what we have going on today. Um, so I just really thank you so much to everybody who's on and who RSVP'd and those who donated. Um, that really means a lot. I know times are tough right now and you have a lot of important choices to make. So um, I just want to give a huge shout out to that because that's uh, really, really meaningful and it doesn't go unnoticed and it's put to really good use. We've got some cool things going on to support our artists and our studios, um, including some rent reduction and uh, options for them to get um, rent relief. So that they can stay in their studios as well as putting it to some cool programs like we have today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Natalie to give an introduction of what's happening today. Great, thank you so much and thank you all for being here again. Um, I'm really excited about this workshop because we get to actually use our hands or if you're not done at the moment with us, which is totally cool, you can just take notes and we will also be recording this as Kaylee said so you can refer back to it if you ever need. But um, I'm so excited about having Anne here. She's an expert natural dyer, and this is an opportunity to think about natural dyeing as something super accessible that we can all do um, in our kitchens, especially when we're all confined to our homes for the foreseeable future. Um, I just want to give a brief introduction on the project. We haven't been um, following along so far. Um, this is a continuation of a conversation that this virtual exhibition, Not Yet Futura Free, is having about embodied translation and language and nonlinear process. And for example, how we use movement, which we were talking about last week, and um, handmade techniques or rituals for healing or to build imagined worlds. So last week we had an artist talk with Nina Q. Allen, who shout out is on, I think, so hi Nina, um, Rex Delfakarin and Ashley Shea, and they were talking about stillness as movement and archiving your personal body's experience to find a unique vocabulary to better share stories and consider the future. Um, this weekend we have this workshop today, and we also have an artist talk tomorrow with three amazing artists, um, Sarah Bueno, Mojda. I'm so sorry, Mojda, I always fudge your last name, so maybe if you don't mind getting off mute and helping me so I, I can learn it forever. Reza Yipur. Reza Yipur. thank you so much. Okay, so Mojda Reza Yipur will be speaking tomorrow, and um, in addition, Hannah Spector, and they will also be talk continuing this conversation about healing and using rituals and language for storytelling. Um, and um, yeah, I'm excited to turn it back to you, Anne. Anne, like I said, is an expert. This is an opportunity to ask her your natural dye questions, but we will also, she'll be leading me in my kitchen through a natural dye experiment where I'm going to attempt to natural dye my handmade mask that my friend Erin Sotliff, who is also involved in the project, um, so sewed for me and it's made out of all natural fibers so if you want to follow along or do this at a later event I'm going to try to see what I can do with all things in my kitchen so no like uh, ordering special ordering mortar and whatnot um excuse my cat also <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then yeah and I'm going to turn it over to yeah. you first but I just wanted to also say that Anne and I foraged, um, socially distantly foraged dandelion <laughs> yesterday. And so that's what I'll be using in my kitchen. And this is something that you can do if you want to go on a walk tomorrow or something and collect dandelions. You also can use onion skins in your kitchen. So if you just are like bored listening to us talking and want to like look around, you can do that too. Um, <laughs> yeah, Anne, thank you. Thank you so much. Can you just share what you're doing, how you um, your natural diet practice a little bit? Yeah, of course. So um, my name is Anne. Thank you for joining us today. I'm super excited to talk about um, the diet process and how I've been doing it since quarantine's happened. Um, I've been working out of my home studio for, I guess, about four or five years now. I've lived in this space that has a really great indoor um, work area. But as soon as the quarantine started, I started to look around um, at the outdoor area and kind of think about what I could do with my outdoor space. So I have a parking spot that's fairly large, but just has a small 
plot of dirt um, and had some like raised concrete. I'll give you a tour after this um, so you can actually see what it's about. But I started to think about how to utilize this space to create um, a dye garden. I've actually been participating as a community member at the MICA, um, in the MICA Fibers program. So this past semester, I've been going up to Baltimore every week. Um, they have this really wonderful program uh, called the Natural Dye Initiative. Um, and it's just such an amazing group of people, um, students, local artists, artisans who come together uh, weekly to talk about the dye process. Um, so it really inspired me because they are partnered with a farm up in Baltimore called Hidden Harvest. Um, and there, this farm is incredible. They are growing indigo, um, madder root, marigolds, just like an amazing selection of dye plants. So it really inspired me to kind of try and think about what I have around me and how I can transform that into a workable dye, um, dye garden. So, uh, and also being home all the time too. And being thought. home. Yeah. Being <laughs> home and like not having that much other, we have like a tiny patio. So like being able to just have this as this outdoor oasis is great. Um, so I've sort of transformed, I can give you a tour now. Tell me, you'll have to tell me if the internet gets really bad, but so this is where I'm at. I have this wall back here, but let me flip it around. So this is sort of the space that I've created. It used to be um, a woodworkers, outdoor studio so it's great like flooring um, and work with the plot of land that I've turned and it was just sort of like heavily some soil but I've turned it into um, a, I mean a proper quote-unquote proper garden but there are some of these seedlings that are coming up which is awesome I think these are all French marigolds over here can you all see mm -hmm. yeah okay great um, and I have about six or seven Maybe it's a little too many. This is also my first time gardening, so I'm learning a lot, but six or seven different types of dye plants in here. Um, there's this little patch that is either Coreopsis or Cosmos, um, but yeah, all really wonderful dye plants that I acquired from this great farm out in Utah called Grand Prismatic Sea. Um, and then I'm also starting indigo plants. So I have these trays here that I started maybe about a month ago and they're coming up pretty nicely. So wow. you can kind of see these indigo plants. This one is kind of coming up the strongest. Um, but it's really awesome just being able to experiment with all of these dye plants right in my backyard. And it doesn't take much. This plot is just like 10 feet by maybe two feet at, or three feet at the largest part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I also have these like little boxes that, so I'm just trying to like maximize space. And so the process of this project is just sort of documenting um, the progression of all of these little plants. Um, I, it's a lot of photos of dirt with like tiny little, little seedlings. seedlings popping up. Yeah, but hopefully at the end of the season, um, there'll be like a significant amount of progress and growth that I can show, um, which is really exciting. I love the metaphor of your project in terms of like you first uh, attempting to garden too. I think it's like just I, like a lesson in that anyone can do it, but it's like such a trial and error. And then I always think of gardening as this like spiritual practice where you like put it all in the dirt and you water the dirt and you water the dirt and it's kind of ugly and like, just like yeah. completely, um, it can be just exhausting and like you feel like you're not doing anything and then some things decide that this is their year to grow and they like take off and then you get to harvest them or take care of them and see what happens with those. I, I just love that like unknown journey and that fact that you were willing to take such a leap in documenting your process as such a beginner. I think because you're a natural dye expert, but um, I think it's amazing to see that. Well, it's been a fun experience because Erin obviously is like to me like a master grower so I kept asking her like how do you plant seeds and she's like you just take the seed and just sort of sprinkle it I mean Erin can probably say it better but just sort of like shuffle it around the dirt and I was like what do you mean you shuffle it around the dirt it was really like the idea that it just seems so simple and the fact that things have actually grown like I was not convinced that these things were going to pop up at all but it's been really fun and like you're saying it's sort of this daily ritual where you can go outside and you have to check on them every single day like you have to water you have to check on them you have to make sure that you're taking care of them and it's been like a really nice daily just daily ritual daily habit 
Can you just list the plants that you're growing? So if like anyone... Yeah, of course. Um, so I think it's, I think you can all, anyone could go ahead and purchase seed at this point, right? Like I think it would, yeah, maybe it's a little late, but you could probably still do it. I oh, have um, so... French marigolds growing. I have Coreopsis. I have both Dyer's Coreopsis and Lanceleaf Coreopsis. I have Scabiosas. Um, I have Cosmos growing. And I also have indigo in the trays. And the indigo comes from, um, it's a Japanese, Japanese indigo. Cool. And there are yeah. all different kinds of indigo. There's like many different varieties. There's many different species of it. Specifically, the kind that I have is just the Japanese variety. Um, and that was mostly just because that's what we've been studying a lot. I hear about it. I've done a lot of big reading on it. Um, a lot of the, like the mica farm is also using um, Japanese indigo. So it's just, it's pretty common. common. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess I can show, do you want to pop into the dyeing stuff now? Yeah, maybe, could you get me started and then I'll yeah. put myself on mute and then you can take us through all of your various projects while I'm starting my, so like if yeah, I was in my kitchen and I just wanted to get into a natural dye um, practice and I have, I foraged for the dandelions mm -hmm. myself, or I peeled all my onions and got the skin, like what, what do I do now? Well, so the really awesome thing about dyeing is that, again, like you're using just things that you found around the house, um, in the yard, in alleyways mostly, you're using kitchen compost. So I think like what's important to know is that you can just have fun with exploring color in your house during this time, especially if you don't have access to the, um, the chemicals and some of the things that you need to prepare the fabric for proper like color fastness. Um, so what Natalie is doing is really just going to be like experimenting with color and really trying to see what comes from daily lines. Um, whether or not that lasts in perpetuity, that's a little bit of a different story, but um, it's just fun to be able to see the color that the dandelions yield. So what you're using right now in your kitchen, you have the mask, you have, do you have a pot that? Um, yeah, and I have cool. a metal pot, which is a good thing, right? Yeah, that's great. The metal, um, depending on the metal, it can reinforce some of the mordanting properties or like the fixing, fixative the properties of the dye. So it's really nice. Um, and then you're going to start with the number one step with um, a lot of dyeing is scouring. And what scouring is, is just washing your fabric really intensely um, in high temperature. Um, you're not going to scour yours. I think, I think this fabric has probably been washed multiple times. It's um, and I used um, some material that she had already washed. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're going to wet that fabric prior to dyeing. Um, you want to fill your pot of water with, since it's a small amount of fabric, you probably just need to use like a liter of water. I wouldn't, just enough to cover the fabric um, or your garment, whatever material is that you're using, just enough to have it flowing free in the pot. Okay. Um, and then you'll want to turn the water on to about a simmer and then you'll add the dandelions into it. And you're basically just creating a tea. Like this, the process of creating natural dyes is very in line with creating teas. Um, so Natalie will get a pot started, bring it to just a simmer, um, and then add the dandelions once the water is like just bubbling. Um, it's really important with a lot of natural dyes, especially f uh, fresh plant materials, that you don't get the temperature too high. So you don't really want like a boiling, um, pot of water because that can degrade the color um and I mean degrade is like I guess a relative term like if you're interested in more like darker um, moodier colors then maybe that's fine maybe that's the look you're going for um, but if you're trying to maintain like a really bright vibrant yellow color for the dandelion specifically then you would just keep it under a simmer okay beautiful yeah mm -hmm. so are you getting that okay. started now I have a question yeah, I'm yeah of course that. Christian do you um are you supposed to remove I just did some, I just yeah. got uh, forage for some data lines like 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, do you take the flower off of the, um, like, like the, you separate it, it from the stem? So dandelion specifically, you can actually, so it, it'll depend on each plant, each flower, what you're working with. Dandelions, you can actually use the whole stem, the leaves, um, the flower head. It's a really incredible plant. Um, I mean, you know, it's like common for people to use it in medicinal or like, medicinal uh, as a medicinal herb or as food um but yeah you can use the entire plant of the dandelion that doesn't go for every single type of plant that you would die with 
but specifically with dandelions, you can use all of it. Okay. I think Nally just has the heads because we just deadheaded them on our walk. Yeah, it's a mix. It's yeah. like no weed, but there's like some long stemmy ones. Yeah. Um, in terms of quantity, like obviously you're foraging, so use whatever you can just to, and especially because we're just playing with color at the moment. But um, the general rule is that for fresh plants, you want to use um, the same amount of, the same weight of dye stuff as the weight of your material. So if your mask weighs 10 grams, you would use 10 grams of fresh dandelions, um, if that makes sense. At, at least one to one ratio, if not more. And if you put more in, does that make the color stronger or does it have no effect? Yeah, it will generally make this color stronger. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the washing it in high temperature before yeah. you, so you just like, uh, like wash it on hot and that's enough? So the proper method of scouring um, would be to take a pot, up, a pot um, fill it with this one, you'd actually want boiling water. You can add um, different materials. I can talk, talk through that more specifically and show you the things I have. Let me put my camera around. So the proper thing that you would use for scouring is um, something called soda ash. Soda ash is, it's like a pretty common household item. You can buy it, like Arm & Hammer makes it. It comes in boxes. You can buy it in your grocery store. It's in the same family as baking soda, but is not the same, does not have the same, um, properties uh but it's like pretty common so you would fill a pot with boiling water add soda ash and then you would add your material to that pot and let it cook really intensely for like 30 minutes at least to an hour so because not a lot of people have access to the soda ash or you know you might not have a pot that you can dedicate just to dyeing which also i should note that if you're doing a lot of like the chemical stuff um, with dyeing, it's important to like separate your cooking and your um, your cooking and your dye dye tools. Um, but since Nally, you're not using anything like caustic, I think that you're fine doing it with your um, regular pots. Yeah, that's part of. The if you don't have I access, I was just gonna say that's part of the reason I personally like just being able to experiment too, because you can use all of your kitchen equipment until you feel comfortable mm -hmm. with the process enough to invest in like a separate pot just for dyeing and like buy the soda mm -hmm. ash too. Mm -hmm. um, but Amy, so if you're not able to do this like intense scouring process at home, yeah, you can just put it in your washing machine on hot, hot water, uh, run it with maybe some pH neutral detergent, um, like a seventh generation type of thing or like, I don't know what other brands there are, but just like a very like clear, clean um, detergent and do it on um, a hot wash. So I'll actually do that with large panels of fabric sometimes because sometimes, sometimes I don't have pots that can um, hold such like large pieces of fabric panels. Um, so the washing machine is like a good alternative to that. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so one, do you have to scour linen? Like that's mm -hmm. already, you still do. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you'll oftentimes get fabric, um, that, so yeah, the reason we scour is because, um, a lot of times when fabric is manufactured, it either in that process, um, picks up a lot of residue or, or that fabric just naturally contains lots of, um, you know, oils or whatever in, in that fiber. Um, so you have to strip all of that residue off of the fiber in order for the dye to actually bond really well and to fix really well in that material. Um, there's just so many steps along the way of manufacturing fabric uh, that it's really important to kind of clean, like start with a really clean, clean slate. Um, I used to not scour at all and I had thought like, oh, it's totally fine. I can skip this process because it takes, it's sort of time intensive. Um, but you actually are losing a lot of dye, which is dye stuff, which is like really valuable and can be expensive. Um, and you're kind of wasting that if you, um, if you don't scour. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I also have one more question, which is does the yeah, water course. that you use to dye, mm -hmm. does that matter? Like, could you use river water? Could you use rainwater? Um, yeah. or specific, like, dye, like distilled water? Um, what's really cool is that 
um, you, yes, so the answer is you can use different types of water. Um, the thing is with natural dyeing, pH levels can really affect the quality of, or the color that you're dyeing. Okay. Um, and so, you know, for certain dye stuff, the pH level could shift that color drastically in one way or another. So, um, you know, well water might be a certain pH that affects your color in a certain way versus filtered water versus river water. But yeah, no, you can totally, like historically, there's like stories of people dying in rivers, which is really cool, um, using river water or like using ocean water, so like salt water. Um, yeah, there's like lots of different, different types that you can use. Wow, that's amazing. Thank yeah. you so much for answering that. Yeah, of course. And ev obviously everyone pop in if you need any questions answered. Happy to do it along the way. But I can also just talk through from the beginning to end. So we've talked pretty extensively about scouring, um, how you can do it at home in a washing machine um, if you don't have the pots and the materials. Um, so scouring is like number one step. I have my scour pot here. So... Can you all see this? Yeah. Cool. So I've just, I have four cotton bandanas in here um, that have been in this pot of water with soda ash for about an hour now. So I think it's ready to go. Um, I have this other pot over here that I'm going to put onion skins into. Um, and I can uh, show you that. So, okay, the first step of dyeing would be scouring. We've talked about that. The next usually would be to um, mordant your fabric. Mordanting is a really important step because if you aren't mordanting your material, then um, your dyes won't um, have as much uh, longevity in the piece. There's mordant is, a mordant is a type of metallic salt. So there's different kinds of mordants out there in the world. A really common one that you'll see often in grocery stores even is something called um, alum. Alum is used in um, water purification and it's also used in canning food. So it's something that you can actually find, like I've seen it in Kroger's baking aisle, spice aisle, um, and it's, it's, it's actually like pretty accessible. Um, depending on what kind of material you're using, whether it's a cellulose-based fiber, which means linen, cotton, bamboo, something that comes from a plant, versus a protein fiber, which is something that comes from an animal, like wool or silk, um, you would mordant your piece in different ways. Um, other types of mordants that are accessible, uh, or sorry, that are used by dyers is aluminum acetate. Aluminum acetate is um, most commonly used for cellulose fibers. Um, and that one is, pretty expensive and it would be something that's like harder for like an average person to acquire. Um, they're available through like dye or dyeing, like dye vendors. Um, but for like the everyday person, I think it would be something that's like kind of um, a little bit more inaccessible. Again, since we're dying at home, just really trying to explore color and just like experimenting with that. Um, I think that we're not so focused on the mordanting. What Natalie is going to use is vinegar, which I personally haven't used, so I think this is going to be really cool um, because I know that it's apparently like a great way to fix color onto the fiber. So we'll see how that works with Natalie's piece. Um, put it in the back of everything, or would I put it in beforehand? You would put it in beforehand. Like you would soak your piece into vinegar before we um, actually uh, dye with it. Right. Okay. So, yeah, so first step is scouring your fabric. Second step is mordanting. Um, the way that you mordant, there's two different methods. Um, it's sort of like an inverse relationship of time versus temperature. So for, if you are um, going to do a room temperature mordant bath, which is just taking your mordant and putting it into um, water and letting the fabric soak overnight, you would want that fabric to, um, you would leave that fabric in that mordant bath for like 24 hours at least. Um, you can also raise that temperature and decrease the amount of time that your fabric sits in that mordant bath. So it's sort of, again, this inverse relationship. Um, I'm not going to mordant today. Like I might, I think usually I would pre-mordant my fabric, which is mordanting it before it goes into the dye pot. But there are many different methods of mordanting. A lot of dyers actually will, um, 
scour, dye their piece, and then after it's dyed, put it into a mordant bath. So that's called a post-mordant. And it's sort of just whatever works for you, whatever is better for your workflow and practice. Um, but I generally will pre-mordant. So, okay, so we talked about, does anyone have questions about mordanting? How long? How long do you have to do that for? Um, so mordanting, it depends on if you're, if it's a room temperature mordanting process, then at least 24 hours. I, I just like create the mordant bath, let the fabric sit in it um, overnight, and then it's ready to go. Again, with a lot of these steps, it's important that you're using enough water, just like enough to cover your fabric. Because if you have fabric that's bunched up into like a pot, big bowl or container, um, the mordant like won't evenly cover and won't be evenly distributed. So you want to make sure that you have a big enough vessel um, for your fabric to move, move around freely too. So, and if we're uh, mordanting afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, how long would that be the same rules that apply? I think so. I've actually never post mordanted, but I believe it would be the same rules. Okay. And probably the room temperature 24 hour bath would be better because it would just have less risk of like leaking colors or is that not a risk? Really? I don't know that that, um, that's a great question. I would actually have to investigate that more um, because the temperature, I don't know that that would, yeah, I don't know that that would cause any sort of like bleeding of the color or like leaking. Okay. Of the color. So, yeah. Oh, one thing that I didn't mention is that um, with all of these steps, the way that we calculate things like the mordants, um, like the quantity of metallic salts, is based on the weight of fiber. Sorry, there's a lot of sirens. <laughs> um, it's all based on weight of fiber. So, you know, backing up, if you were to do this and you wanted like consistency time and time again, what you would do is actually um, weigh your dry fiber. So Natalie, you would have weighed that mask before wetting it. Um, and all of these different things like uh, mordants would be calculated as like a percentage of that weight of fiber. But again, we're like getting into the nitty gritty and really this is just about like exploring color and experimenting. So um, if you want more details on those things specifically, I can definitely send you information or you can like email me and I can talk to you more in depth about that. Um, but since we're just trying to like have fun, I think those are less important. Okay, so um, after we've scoured and mordanted, what you want to do is create your dye bath. And I have a whole jar of onion skins that I have um, saved over the course of, I don't know how long, but um, it's really awesome because they're already dry and you know it's really easy to store. Um, I've had my pot going for a while now. And I'm going to just take my onion skins and dump them into the pot. Onion skins are really, yellow onion skins are really awesome because the color is like so intense. Um, just using like a little bit of the onion skins. Let me, let me use both my hands, I'll be right back. Um, but the color is really intense and I don't, I didn't look in the chat, but I saw, I think there was a question about red or yellow onion skins, I'm not sure. But, yeah. okay, cool. Um, yellow onion skins will dye like this really beautiful amber, amber like golden color and red onion skins can sometimes go into like a greenish greenish zone so you can already kind of see some of the colors like coming out of the onion skins um a friend of mine who's a chef actually told me that he will um keep the skins on his onions when he's making stock because the color just like enhances the broth and makes for like more beautiful stocks so that's actually something interesting because yeah, you can already see the colors like shifting so quickly. It's coming out very, very, um, really fast. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to just let that cook for a while. How long a while? Um, I'll let the color extract for about like 10 to 20 minutes before I put the fabric in. Cool. Yeah, and you'll kind of see it with onion skin specifically, you'll start to see the color coming out of the skins and the skins will start to look translucent. Mm -hmm. um, so there's sort of this like, um, like passing of the color between the skins and the actual pot. Mm -hmm. So and yeah, that was for, the yeah, that was just right. hot water. Yeah, that was just cool. hot water. 
Other things that you could dye with from your kitchen, um, avocado skins, avocado pits. My roommates have all saved like a ton of pits and skins for me, which is really cool. Um, you can also dye with tea, coffee grounds, um, pomegranate skins, which if you're on, depending on what coast you're on, might grow in your own yard. Um, so there's a lot of really great turmeric is something that's really common. Um, it's kind of pricey, but the color is really awesome. And turmeric actually doesn't, um, isn't actually as color fast as some other dyes, but it's just like a fun uh, kitchen, kitchen material to use. Turmeric, the plant or the actual root? You can use turmeric powder, like oh, that oh, you get in your okay. spice aisle, but yeah, you could, if you had the plant, like for sure, you could definitely die with that. But it's such a costly, costly material, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anyone ask any questions about the dyeing process? I have a question. So yeah. right now, are you, is the are the onion skins in just uh, plain water, or do, is there something in the water with the pot? No, it's just plain water. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So again, extracting color from dye stuff is just like making a tea. So you just put the dye, like the material, the plant, the flower, the skins, whatever it is, into hot, hot simmering water. Um, and then you'll let that sit for between like 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the thing that you're dyeing with. Um, and then that, that's the color extraction, the dye extraction part of it. Yeah. Um, I can also show you indigo. So right now we're focused a lot on like what's accessible at home and um, kitchen compost materials. But indigo is this really amazing dye. It's very, you know, there's like, it's very historic. Um, every culture, almost every culture has a different type of indigo. Um, it's grown in like every part of the world. And it's just this really beautiful, magical plant. Um, that I'm excited to be growing, but also I have a vat going in my in my little spot here. Um, I want to show you so the three different stages of it. I have the little seedlings here, which I showed earlier, um, and then I have these larger plants. Wow. And these are from Hidden Harvest Farm, actually, uh, up in Baltimore, the one that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and these are ready to go in the ground. They actually should should go a step into some plot of land um, but you can kind of see that they're flowering a little bit they have these little plant pink flowers um, and these plants specifically came from a seed directly from japan um, there's this amazing group of dyers out there called i think it's baisuo b-a-i-s-o-u um, but they're really well known and i would definitely recommend looking them up for their awesome work but these indigo plants um, are about maybe like 10 inches, eight to 10 inches tall, and that's when you put them into the ground. Um, indigo works a lot differently than the process that we're doing with the onion skins. With indigo, what you're doing is creating a vat. Uh, and that is because if you were to take, if you were to take this plant and just put it into a pot of water, um, you wouldn't get like the color that you get wouldn't be able to stick to the fabric. Nothing, like nothing actually adheres to the fabric just from boiling this in hot water and adding fabric. Um, that's going, to, that's how it works with the onion skins and other plant plants in the dye world. But with indigo specifically, you have to create that um, because the indigo pigment in its natural state is not soluble. So what happens when you're creating a vat is actually creating a soluble version of that pigment um, which allows that color to adhere to the fabric in a permanent way. So, okay, so this um, is the fresh plant and this is my indigo vat, which was created using indigo powder, um, which comes in this form, indigo powder from Stony Creek Colors. Um, Stony Creek is this really wonderful farm in, okay, it's in Springfield, Tennessee, um, but they are uh, really well known in the dye world and they have uh, an amazing source of indigo plants and extracts. So that's where the vat that I'm about to show you, um, that's where the indigo was sourced from. So what happens is that the indigo, when it comes in a plant like this, um, it's processed down into a powder form. 
um, and that happens through yeah, every culture has its own different method for create like from getting from the plant to this um, powder form but in Japan um, the commonly used process is a composting process so they would take the leaves break it down over the course of like a hundred days and eventually it gets worked down into this powder form a hundred days yeah I think it's like a hundred it's a hundred day process it's like this very long and like a it takes I think it takes something like 2,000 plants for like 100 grams of indigo extract. I could be getting those numbers totally wrong. Don't, don't quote me on that, actually. I'll have to look up those numbers. But it takes like a very large amount of plants to create a very small amount of indigo powder. So it's this really beautiful color. It's really historic. So many, um, you know, amazing um, stories around this plant um, but the process that goes behind growing processing creating the that like it's 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 like a very intensive process um, so this here is um, the indigo vet that I created which is a mineral vet um, there's different ways to create indigo vets the one that I used um, which is a mineral reduction um, is really great because this vat can live at room temperature and die really beautifully um, without having to be uh, like warm. Um, the historic methods of creating indigo vats would be a fermentation vat or a sugar vat, a quick sugar vat, um, and that's more like the process of, of let's say um, keeping a kombucha or something. Um, you have a vat that you have to constantly feed and calibrate um, when you're creating a fermentation bed. So those are a little bit trickier. Um, people master that art of making a fermentation indigo vat, you know, like people apprentice for years uh, to learn how to do that process. Um, and it's very much this like close relationship that people have with the indigo vat because um, what's really awesome is that people will say like your indigo vat will talk to you. Like you can look at some signs um, to tell how it's doing. You, know, you can look at the color, you can look at the bubbles on top. You can um, really learn to like communicate with your indigo vat in this like very beautiful kind of poetic way. Um, so which I think is all just Sorry to interrupt you. That's oh, all yeah, yeah. to dye one, um, one fabric, or can you keep it like alive, quote unquote? No, you can keep this alive. Um, right now, this five gallon, it's like a painter's bucket, or you mm -hmm. could maybe people use it for like compost. Um, five gallons of liquid um, used 50 grams of indigo powder, and this will dye um, a significant amount of fabric. Like this will last me maybe like a month to two months of dying but like I also am not dying like large quantities of or like big panels of fabric regularly so that would probably be um I'd say maybe like if we're equating it to garments like I, I don't know 20 t-shirts or something like that maybe not even that but so this that was created again it's a mineral vat and what that means is um i use something called um ferrous or iron so i use iron as well as pickling lime or slate slime to create this reduced indigo um, which allows you to dye um, and allows the pigment to adhere to the fabric so does anyone have questions on that that was also a lot of info. I want to just comment that like, like what you were talking about with indigo I think is like an interesting story that we don't have time for today but just the labor intensive aspect of it and how um, natural dyeing is like a very radical act in some ways because you're able to take control of that process and not uh, and natural dyeing has to adhere to natural fibers as well and so by like thinking in this way you're also kind of reshifting the system like the uh, textile industry too which uses so much water and like and exploits labor all over the world and so i think it's like it's there's both like a positive and a negative story to it too but like empowering to be able to use it in your kitchen um yeah, and then also just giving instead of like this um, idea of consuming so much constantly and like trying to refresh your wardrobe constantly, um, that 
you can break that and just give your existing articles new life, which is awesome. Um, with things that just would otherwise be considered trash. I think that's like the most beautiful part of natural dyeing is that even when you're thinking about the, like the floral industry and um, when Aaron was working at Willem Gardens and would let me come out to the farm, we would dye with the flowers that were thrown away or would be considered compost. So it's just awesome being able to take things that are discarded or overlooked and just using them in a way that can really be like create these beautiful garments and um, just like revive pieces of clothing in your in your closet. Um, and then to also okay. stop you, for, because I have a question. So yeah. my, um, my vat is boiling and can you can just mm -hmm. remind us for those of us um, dying at home, like how long it sh things should boil depending on what the ingredient is inside? Like yeah, so minutes. the extraction, yeah. For you, I would start with just 20 to 30 minutes to extract the dye. Um, and then the actual dyeing process, as in um, the amount of time that your fiber or garment is in the dye, anywhere between 40, 40 minutes to an hour. Um, and it doesn't hurt to continue that longer. Okay, I think Christian has a yeah. question. Yes, Christian. Do you? I was actually just like stretching my head. But... Okay, <laughs> You're putting your finger up. <laughs> but I'm showing you the, um, I don't know if you remember earlier, the onion skin color was just sort of a light yellow, but now you can see it is this like beautiful sunset orange. Mm -hmm. It is awesome. And it, I'm going to put the fabric in now so that you can kind of see that color. Um, but yeah, you can see how, like, I mean, just how intense that color is. And then the longer the fabric lives in this, um, in this dye pot, the more intense that color will be. And so how, if you were trying to make patterns or um, like how, sorry if I'm skipping ahead or something. No, no, yeah. If you were trying to make patterns or tell some sort of story on your fabric, what, how would you do that? So it's really fun um, to play with, like, my favorite types of pattern making are just using materials that I can find really easily around the house. I really just like, using things like rubber bands or string or clothes pins um, to create resists on my fabric. So for something like this bandana, I might fold it and place um, at random like some clothes pins on it to create these, like wherever the clothes pin is touching the fabric, that'll be a white area or wherever the rubber band, you know, is tied around um, the fabric, then that also creates white areas. So you can just find whatever you have around your house um, and just tie, just like go back to your like tie dye making days, um, you know, just like summer camp making t-shirts and just have fun with your um, fabric and just sort of try and experiment that way. So I'm also going to show you a dip in the indigo vat. So I'm wetting my fabric out. I am rinsing it after it came out of the scouring pot because I want to get some of that residue off. But the important thing about putting your fabric into an indigo vat is that you want to make sure the material is um, wet but not like soaking wet. Because what happens is um, what you're doing in creating a reduced indigo vat is that you're taking all the oxygen out. So um, this, like you, you want to make sure that you don't introduce oxygen back into the vat because that will make the indigo insoluble. And this will make a little bit more sense, like the visual demonstration is a lot easier. But so I'm wringing my fabric out really dry so that water's not dripping out. So indigo, when you've reduced it into a vat or when you have, have it in a reduced state, actually is this yellowish brown. I don't know if you can kind of see like the brownish shades. Do you all see that? Yeah. So it's not the blue that you would imagine. Yeah, it's it's the reduced state of indigo is this yellowish bronze color. Um, and then when you pull, so I'm just sort of zhuzhing it around <laughs> this, um, you see how it's green? Wow. The fabric is kind of greenish. So I'm just moving it around underneath the surface of the indigo vat. Probably do it for about you know, 30 seconds or so. Uh, I'll squeeze the fabric out below the surface so it doesn't drip back. 
And then I don't know if you can see the transformation of that color. Yes. But do you see that? Yeah. It's it's turning into blue. It's a really beautiful blue. It's like teal almost. Yeah, it's like a sky color. Amazing. And so yeah, and so what's happening is that as oxygen is re-entering this fabric, um, it's turning that insoluble or sorry, that soluble blue back into the insoluble indigo. So yeah, you can see how vibrant that blue is now. So cool. It's really cool. And the really awesome thing about indigo is that the color builds with every dip that you make. So whereas with my onion skin, like my onion skin pot, I would keep that in the pot for 30 minutes to an hour to get like a deep color. Um, for this, if I wanted a deeper blue, I would dip it multiple times in the vat. So yeah, I'm going to rinse it in water because the water helps accelerate the oxidation process. Um, and in between each dip of the indigo, you want full oxidation of your piece because you want every, um, like you want every part of it to be fully oxidized. And um, I think that makes for a longer lasting blues. But yeah, let me hang this up and then you can kind of see it from afar. Or here, I can just take it here. So cool and... <laughs> I, I know it's a really like magical that. process. It's really awesome. Yeah, do you see that? Wow, yeah. it's crazy how much it looks like the color of the sky, but it also turned blue by the sky or by the air. But you know. it really is the same color. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions about indigo or maybe like how you can do this at home? I have a question. Yeah. Um. I'm sorry if you already mentioned this, but I'm wondering about the the color of the fabric that you're working with to dye. Would you kind of always recommend it to be white or light? No. So that's the really fun thing is, you know, you can over dye any color. Um, you can start with a cream color fabric and over dye that. Um, most natural fabrics um, tend to be like an off white. Um, the pure white fabrics have been bleached in the manufacturing process. So no, I, I would rec I, I can I would say you can dye with any start with any color fabric. Um, the most important thing is that you are working with a natural material. So either 100% um, cotton or 100% wool, whatever it is, it should just be a natural fiber. So that that's like animal product from so like wool or um plant protein pot. fiber or yeah protein or cellulose fiber yeah sorry my cat is going crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah does anyone else have any questions should i oh yeah did someone else oh, no. oh yeah i have a question are there other yeah plants similar to indigo that like get Kind of fermented and have this oxidation and reduction process or is that very specific um, to indigo? Um, that's a good question. I believe it's very specific to indigo. I know that there is some kind of like historically there was a way of getting purple from this I think it's like a mollusk um, and I think that that might work by, by way of some oxidation process but I don't know for sure but also this this particular animal like clammy whatever you call those things like sh hard shell animal thing is like practically extinct at this point um but as far as i know i think indigo is the only one that is one that is like it's very rare i think it's like the one of the few that does this um this reduction process yeah but there are like i can't There's remember the exact there. thing with this particular thing there's a bug that's there's not like indigo. Yeah, there's something called cochineal. There's a bug called cochineal um, that um, is a scale insect that lives on cactuses. Um, and those are actually, those have been domesticated. Um, Oaxaca is like a, a large place, like it's a main place where those are domesticated. Um, but yeah, that actually that actually is dyed using like the same method of like the onion skins. You would just sort of create an extract 
um, and a T basically with that. But it it is from a it is from a an insect. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I'm gonna my dandelion tea has been boiling, simmering for 20 minutes. So I'm just gonna oh, cool. awesome. and dip it in. So we can, yeah, probably won't see the transformation, but then at least we can like walk through all the steps. Yeah, for sure. And it smells like dandelion tea, obviously. But oh, that's, that's awesome. Like, that's one of the cool things about this. I guess you can't, you probably couldn't drink the byproduct. Maybe you could. There's nothing bad in it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But I'll show you my onion skin one also. So this is what the onion skin dye looks like after a little bit. So right now you can see the color is kind of muted and that's because I'm not working with more dented fabric. Um, I think if I had more dented this bandana before, then the color might be a little bit richer, um, but still I think it's a gorgeous color. Um, the thing to note about wet fabric is that the color you see on wet fabric is going to dry about like one to two shades lighter. So whatever you see in the pot or whatever comes out of the pot um, will be darker than what it will look like when it's dry. I have a question. Yes. Um, so I'm currently dyeing a linen dress and it has not been scored or mordanted. And then I, and I added it into the tea, the onion skin tea, and it has mm -hmm. not, any, nothing really happened. So I'm wondering if I should, um, like if I should mordant it before, if I should mordant it before doing the bath and or can I reuse this tea or should or start saving skins again? You can definitely re so if you're worried that the color is not sticking, it probably is more than the mordanting. It's probably a scouring issue. Scouring. So okay. yeah, um, I think that um, the number one thing would be to take the fabric out and then try and scour it. So just like throw it in your hot wash, or if you have a pot, you can just throw it in the boiling water for a small amount of time. Um, but I think more than the mordanting, it is a scouring issue. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And can you repeat again what um, the temperature is when you're dye or like putting the fabric in with the dye? So you yeah, sure. simmer the tea and then when you put the fabric in? Um, so because you're, I would say because you're working with a fresh plant material, you're using the fresh dandelions, I would only keep it to a simmer. Um, so don't get it to a boil and you want to keep it at a simmer. You can definitely get it over that. You can definitely have it boiling. Um, it just will change the color and it'll make it a little bit more, um, you know, maybe a little bit moodier or um, it tends to go towards like the browner shades. So if you're interested in acquiring like those neutral tones as opposed to like a bright saturated yellow, then totally you can boost that temperature. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions about their current or future dye projects? I have a question. Yes. Um, so I'm interested in doing a kind of like uh, maybe a slightly more updated version of, of tie dye, mm -hmm. specific for a pair of white pants that I have. Yes. Um, yeah. I want to do like some like sort of vertical like stripes. And I was thinking, okay, how would I do this as a like, 10th grader doing tie-dye in my parents' bathroom, like you would kind of like fold it, you know, like a paper fan or something like that, yeah. maybe. I don't really know. And then like, how do you, if I were to do this with natural dye, how do you get it from, I mean, because you, you're showing us how to soak things and get them fully immersed, but then like, if you wanted to do sort of like more spot treatments on things, like how do you put it in a squirt bottle? Like, how do you get it from there to there? That's so, not terrible, terribly worth question. Um, yeah, no, so you can definitely, like the tie-dye methods are really fun, again, like using rubber bands. Um, are you talking more of like a structured look? So like you want to do the, the accordion folds, or are you talking more of like the starbursts and the spirals and stuff like that? Not, yeah, more, more like folds, but I, I, they don't need to be like precise or exact. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what you would do is actually, um, so this is like, um, like shibori, so like the Japanese art of folding and tying um, mm -hmm. your fabric. So there's a lot of really great resources on that, but what you could look up is um, shibori, shibori, uh, I don't know, just look up shibori techniques. 
Um, yeah. But what you would do is sort of fold your garment and then use boards or use um, like pieces of wood or like mason jar lids, um, anything that you can find to create resists. You'd also need clamps probably. So what I have a lot of in my studio is um, those, those metal C clamps. Um, uh -huh. they, they kind of, you know, they have the C and then the screw thing that like gets really, really tight. Yeah. And so what you would do is sort of fold your fabric, whether that's a t-shirt or your pants or whatever, um, and then cr use those boards and clamp them on either side of your piece to create those resists. So what you're doing is um, wherever those boards are touching the fabric, those would maintain white space. You're like cool. keeping those white, yeah. And they would the thing about them with, that, with the clamps on. Yeah, actually, so what you would do, um, so after you dye all of these things, what you're gonna do is give it a rinse and you wanna rinse your garment or your fab, whatever it is, um, until the water runs relatively clear. So in the case of doing the clamping, what you would do is you would keep those clamps on while you're rinsing. Um, and you want to rinse it until it's clear and then you can take the clamps off and you can dry without the clamps on it. Cool. I will say that for some of those folding techniques for something like pants, um, because the material is so thick, um, you have a tendency to get more white area um, because the dye has a hard time penetrating the piece mm. because there's so many layers of fabric that it has to work through. So, um, what oftentimes will happen is that you'll look at a piece and you think that it's dyed fully through, um, but then you open it up and then it's like significant amount of white space. Ah. So just keep that in mind as you're looking at it. Like um, with thicker fabrics, it takes a lot of time for the dye to like permeate all of those layers. I have cool. um, I have pants on that are natural dyed and they look yes, those are so cool. But they look like really not. They look really tie dye like. I think not. Um, and uh, not on purpose, but just because of the amount of fabric. But yeah, uh, yeah, I bet it was like scrunched up and then put into a dye pot and then just wherever the folds happened. I think that's yeah. probably what happened. Shout out yeah. to Eva if you're here or watching this in the future. She dyed them for me and she's also a natural dyer. So, so cool. <laughs> but yeah, it's a fun pro Panzer is like, I think is a good goal. Yeah. yeah, it'll be super fun. Are they denim? Um, I think that they're cotton or like, so it's like a light cotton, kind of like a khaki like fabric. Okay. But I think that's, a, and that would be another thing to keep in mind is the amount of dye that you would need for some, for like pants, right? You'd need a yeah, lot. Yeah. So again, like with dyeing projects, you want to start with the weight of fiber. So if your pair of pants weighs, you know, 500 grams, um, then you would need a significant amount of dye stuff to, to get more vibrant colors at least. Yeah. I think you had mentioned putting it into bottles, um, you know, more of like the direct application method. Mm -hmm. And I think that that would be possible with natural dyes, but I think that um, you might want to use like a higher concentration of dye stuff to make like more saturated colors. I haven't mm -hmm. actually done that before. I have some friends who were experimenting with that actually recently, and I'll have to ask how that goes, but it's something that I think would be really fun to try with natural dyes. Cool. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Anne. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions before we? Like, you want to show a piece? Did it get? I mean, we can see. I don't think it's doing that much. Well, is it not? It's doing it a little bit. I think it'll just need to simmer in here for a really long time. But okay. Yeah. It's still a little bit yellow. Actually, it translates kind of well. It's kind of oh, like okay, yeah. It's becoming like a soft, like kind of sun, like light sunshiny and you said that it might be kind of green and i think that that is actually happening which is exciting for me oh, cool. this light color green is one of my favorite colors um, <laughs> but yeah you can kind of i don't know in the light you can see it slowly starting so i'll probably keep this in the bath for another half an hour um cool. just yeah. keep seeing how it transforms but the water itself it looks kind of like pee but it's like it's definitely <laughs> got a color <laughs> <laughs> cool yeah well again if anyone wants to try this at home and then you have questions like feel free to email me I you can probably get my information from Natalie and I'm happy to answer any questions as we're doing it and, and oh 
No, go ahead. Would, go you, ahead. would you put any Thanks. contact information you're willing to share in the chat box? Oh, yeah, sure. Just send my email now. Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. Another yeah. thing that's great about natural dyeing is that you don't have to worry about your kids doing it. And Quincy has already asked if we can do a dye project. So thank you, Anne. Yeah, and he was watching. And he also noticed that his boat is the color of indigo. So he was very interested in it. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It would be super cool. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. <laughs> bye. We're going to hop off, but thank you. This was okay, awesome. Okay, bye, Amy. See you. Bye, Quincy. Well, thank you all so much. Um, we also have another talk tomorrow at two, um, like I said at the beginning. And one of the artists who's talking tomorrow, Sarah Bueno, has a project up on the site, Not Yet Future of Free, which I'll put right here too, where you can participate in um, an open call she has for a monument project where she's asking people at home to make bricks. So if you really are interested in continuing to work in your home with like DIY products and be a part of a future art project. She's just asks for a like open call for brick making and she has a whole explanation on the site too. But that's again just like continuing this conversation about transforming things from your home into art or a form of language or a form of expression or storytelling. And so we're just going to continue that um, tomorrow too. And if you what if time is that program any, tomorrow? Or no, there's a different program tomorrow, if you could share that too. Yeah, 2 to 3.30 is that um, artist talk, where Sarah will be talking. And she's actually based in Istanbul now, which is why the talk is a little earlier, so we can um, get her in Europe. And um, yeah, if you end up using this for natural dye products, or if you watch this later and you end up doing product projects, please send them to us if you feel free, mm -hmm. or if you feel like it. We'd love to see what you create. I'll put my email in the chat too, because you can contact me or Anne. And I put the exhibition website up in the chat box, and that's where you can go to get all the information about upcoming programming and RSVP and all of that good stuff. But thank you all so much. It's so nice to see all of your faces and spend the afternoon with you. <laughs> so much love. Anita, that background, those trees. <laughs> it looks amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really lucky. You, everyone. It's a ponderosa pine forest, New wow. Mexico. Oh wow. wow. And the bark is so red. I almost wonder if you could do something with that. Mm. I wonder, yeah. I'll have to look that one up. Amazing. Yeah. Bye you all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you so much, Anne. Thank you, Anne. See ya. Thanks. Thanks